done the medic hello and welcome to another lecture in the lecture series today we are going to be talking about peptic ulcer disease now peptic ulcer can be defined as a defect in the gastric or duodenal mucosa with a diameter of at least 0.5 centimeters and a depth that penetrates through the muscularis mucosae. Now this is important when differentiating erosions from ulcers because you know that erosions are more superficial than ulcers and ulcers in general involve damage of the submucosa. So it extends beyond the um, mucosal layer and goes into the submucosa. Now, there are two subtypes of peptic ulcer. We have gastric ulcer, which is a kind of peptic ulcer that affects the gastric mucosa. And this ulcer is mostly located in the lesser curvature in the transitional portion between the body and the antrum of the stomach. Then we also have duodenal ulcer, which is a kind of peptic ulcer that affects the duodenal mucosa. And it's usually located in the anterior or posterior wall of the duodenal bulb. As for the causes, there are two major contributing factors to the development of peptic ulcer disease. And they are infection with H. pylori and usage of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, both of these factors contribute to the development of peptic ulcer disease and interact with other risk factors to promote the ulcer formation. H. pylori is actually associated with about 40-70% to of all duodenal ulcers and about 20-25% of all gastric ulcers. The rate of Helicobacter pylori infection is decreasing. So peptic ulcer because of H. pylori infection is also decreasing. Now as for the use of NSAIDs, uh, people who use NSAIDs are at a fourfold risk of developing peptic ulcer disease. And this NSAID use actually increases the risk for complication of peptic ulcer disease. H. pylori infection and chronic NSAID use are not always the only cause for um, ulcer disease. Most times, there are additional risk factors. Some of these risk factors include smoking, heavy alcohol use, um, glucocorticoids, caffeine, and we know that these are shared risk factors for peptic ulcer disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and also gastritis. Um, also, diet can also be an associated risk factor. Psychological factors like, for instance, anxiety, stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, and also genetic factors. Now, there are also some rare causes of peptic ulcer disease, and they are divided into acid hypersecretory states, non-NSAID medications, infections, and others. As for the acid hypersecretory states, we have Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, also known as gastrinoma, we have systemic mastocytosis and also hyperparathyroidism. As for the non NSAID medications, we have acetaminophen or paracetamol use. Uh, we have bisphosphonates, we have sirolimus, we have mycophenolate, and we have selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and also some chemotherapeutics like, for instance, 5 fluorouracil. As for the infections that are rare causes of uh, peptic ulcer disease, we have cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex virus, Epstein-Barr virus, and Helicobacter helmani. Others include radiation, use of illicit drugs, systemic inflammatory diseases, and mechanical causes. Now let's look at the pathophysiology. Now first of all, Let's talk about the normal physiological process. So now, under physiological conditions, the cells that produce the hydrochloric acid that is part of the gastric juice is the parietal cells. And they also secrete intrinsic factors. It is usually stimulated by acetylcholine, histamine, and gastrin. It is inhibited by prostaglandins and somatostatin. Now, we have the mucosal cells that secrete the protective mucus is also stimulated by acetylcholine, prostaglandins that inhibit HCL, by the way, and secretin. We have the chief cells that are responsible for secretion of pepsinogen, 
It is stimulated by acetylcholine, gastrin, secretin, and vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. Now that we know the normal physiology, let's talk about the mechanism of physiological disruption. So we know H. pylori can cause both gastric and duodenal ulcers. So in gastric ulcers, we have secretion of urease by this H. pylori, which then aids the conversion of urea to ammonia. Now, this ammonia causes alkalinization of the acidic environment. By so doing, it makes H. pylori to be able to survive in the lumen of the stomach. Now, this H. pylori goes ahead and colonizes and also attaches itself to the epithelial cells. It then releases cytotoxins like, for instance, CAG-A toxin, and then causes disruption of the mucosal barrier and damage to the underlying cells. In the case of duodenal ulcers, Helicobacter pylori inhibits somatostatin secretion. By so doing, it increases secretion of gastrin, which then increases the amount of hydrogen ions that are secreted. By so doing, there is excess delivery of hydrogen ions into the duodenum. Now, the direct spread of this Helicobacter pylori in the duodenum causes inhibition of duodenal bicarbonate secretion. And when bicarbonate is not secreted enough, there is acidification and there is insufficient neutralization of the duodenal contents. Now let's talk about the mechanism of physiological disruptions in case of chronic NSAID use. So, NSAIDs cause the inhibition of COX-1 and COX-2. By so doing, there is decrease of prostaglandin production and then this causes erosion of the stomach mucosa. There can also be decreased mucosal blood flow in the case of NSAID use. And this can cause inhibition of mucosal um, cell proliferation. Another mechanism of physiological disruption is acid hypersecretion. So let's say, for instance, someone has Zollinger-Ellison syndrome that is characterized by acid hypersecretion and then also um, increased gastrin production. This will cause increased secretion of hydrogen ions and amount of parietal cells and then this will cause delivery of excessive acid into the duodenum. Now talking about the clinical features, um, peptic ulcer disease may be asymptomatic or manifest with a variety of clinical features for instance like general dyspepsia or even complications such as perforation or bleeding. Now as for the asymptomatic peptic ulcer disease up to 70% of patients with peptic ulcer disease do not have symptoms. As for the symptomatic uh, peptic ulcer, the most common symptom is abdominal pain and it's usually located in the epigastrium and sometimes the pain radiates to the left or even the right upper quadrant. The pain is usually described as gnawing or burning. It can be related to meal intake depending on the location of the ulcer. Now, this is an important um, way to differentiate between gastric and duodenal ulcers. So, in uh, gastric ulcers, the pain usually increases shortly after eating. And these people will look anorexic because they will not want to eat because of the pain that occurs immediately after eating. Now, the reason for this is because food usually stimulates gastric acid release from the stomach. And when this patient eats, more acid is released and then this causes uh, worsening of the pain and eventually the patients begin to learn that if they eat less, they will avoid pain. So these patients are usually, uh, they look anorexic. While for um, duodenal ulcers, the pain is usually relieved with food intake. So in these people, you will see that they have um, increased weight, so weight gain in this particular case. And the pain usually occurs uh, two to five hours after you've eaten already. The reason why the pain actually is relieved during eating is because the food actually neutralizes and buffers the gastric acid before it reaches the duodenum. Now, let's talk about the diagnostic approach to uh, peptic ulcer diseases. So, as for the initial evaluation for all patients, we have to screen for common etiologies on history. So for instance, we clerk whether the person has 
um, like history of NCDUs. And also we consider CBC and basic metabolic panel as well as fecal occult blood tests if there is suspicion of occult bleeding. Now for patients that are less than or equal to 60 years of age without any red flags for dyspepsia, we can begin non-invasive testing for helicobacter pylori infection, which includes urea breath test and also um, H. pylori stool antigen test. Now for patients that are more than 60 years of age or more than 45 years of age in areas with high gastric cancer prevalence or patients with red flags for dyspepsia on a case-by-case -case basis or even patients that are unresponsive to empiric medical therapy should be referred directly to um, esophageal gastroduodenoscopy or any other indicated diagnostic study, for instance, liver chemistry and abdominal ultrasound for jaundice. Now, further evaluation is recommended in patients with persistently uncertain etiology. So, in these patients, we consider specialized laboratory studies like, for instance, secreting stimulation tests for Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Now, let's talk about the most accurate test to confirm peptic ulcer disease. This is actually called esophagogastroduodenoscopy. Now, it is used for malignancy screening to differentiate peptic ulcer disease from gastric cancer. And this is done by visualization of lesions and then also um, biopsy sampling with the esophageal gastroduodenoscopy. Then we can also use this for invasive helicobacter pylori testing. And then we can do simultaneous therapeutic measures, like for instance, hemostasis with electrocautery for any active bleeding. Now on this slide, we can see um, endoscopic findings or esophageal gastroduodenoscopic uh, findings. On the left, we can see duodenal ulcer, and then on the right, we can see gastric ulcer. What can actually make you want to do biopsy when performing esophageal gastroduodenoscopy? So, in gastric ulcers, multiple biopsies are usually recommended in most cases. So, um, we take sample from the edge and the base of the ulcer. And this is essential to rule out malignancy, which is not uncommon in gastric ulcers. We should do multiple biopsies from different areas of the stomach lining, and that should include those that are not surrounding the ulcer. And this is to test for helicobacter pylori infection. For duodenal ulcers, in most cases, they are benign and they don't require biopsy. But if we see that there is endoscopic features for malignancy, then definitely um, biopsy is recommended in this particular case. Now, for the specialized lab studies, you can consider this when the etiology still remains unclear or the patient has recurrence of ulcers. So, some of these specialized lab studies include fasting serum gastrin and secretin stimulation test. In this test, we measure the baseline serum gastrin level and repeat after administration of secretin. If there are high levels of gastrin, then this is confirmatory of um, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. We can also do serum intact parathyroid hormone level tests because remember, hyperparathyroidism is a rare cause of um, peptic ulcer disease. We can also do um, some specific tests for systemic inflammatory disease, like for instance, uh, Beckett's disease, and then also Crohn's disease. As for the treatment, first of all, we'll um, employ some non-pharmacological measures, like for instance, asking the patients to stop um, NSAID use, that is, if it is permissible, because there are certain patients that um, no matter what, you can actually not stop this NSAID use. So if it is permissible to stop the NSAID use, then, um, yeah, you ask the patient to stop NSAID use. Then um, also, if this patient is an alcoholic, you ask the patient to restrict alcohol intake. Then after some time, we follow up to confirm whether there is a treatment success. And then, um, if it's possible, we can do endoscopic surveillance. Now, if um, this doesn't work, then we can go ahead and then do 
H. pylori test and treat strategy. So when we do those non-invasive uh, tests, like for instance, the breath test and then also the fecal test, if it comes out positive for H. pylori infection, then we'll start helicobacter pylori eradication therapy with certain antibiotics and then also um, with uh, proton pump inhibitors. Then uh, we continue this acid suppression medication for about four to eight weeks. Then if it comes out negative when you do this uh, test, then we just uh, start trial of acid suppression medication for about four to eight weeks. Then we reevaluate re later on. Now, if there is failure of this pharmacological treatment, then of course we have to consider elective surgery. So now let's go a bit deeper into the medical treatments of peptic ulcer disease. So pharmacologic therapy for uncomplicated peptic ulcer disease usually include a trial of acid suppression therapy. And if helicobacter pylori is detected, then we should start um, the eradication therapy. It may complement this with antacids for rapid symptom relief and in some cases with cryoprotective agents for mucosal protection. All patients will be counseled on lifestyle and risk factor modification. Now, the medications include acid suppression medications and antacids. So, for acid suppression medication, we can talk about proton pump inhibitors. Uh, for antacids, we can talk about uh, usage of uh, sodium bicarbonate and the rest. For cryoprotective agents, these are usually agents that uh, protect the gastrointestinal mucus. And we have drugs like, for instance, sucralfate, which is a sucrose sulfate aluminium complex that reacts with hydrochloric acid in an acidic environment to create a protective barrier over the gastric or duodenal mucosa. It also acts as an acid buffer and promotes bicarbonate production. It should not be taken simultaneously, however, with proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers. Then we have misoprostol, which is actually a synthetic prostaglandin E1 analog. And also we use antibiotics. So let's say, for instance, we do um, testing for H. pylori and it comes out positive, then we can also use um, antibiotics. Examples include clithromycin triple therapy. It is usually combined with uh, amoxicillin and uh, proton pump inhibitors. Then also, um, we can employ some non-pharmacological measures like I mentioned before. So alcohol restriction, um, stopping of uh, smoking, and also avoiding intake of caffeine and also stress. It's important to point out that alcohol does not actually cause ulcer. It doesn't assist in ulcer formation, but it actually prolongs the healing time of the ulcers. Also, we should avoid um, medications that can worsen this peptic ulcer disease, so medications like um, NSAIDs, and also we have to reduce or stop corticosteroids if uh, possible. Another one is avoiding eating before bedtime. That's because eating before bedtime actually increases nocturnal gastric acid levels. Now, we'll talk about surgical treatment. So, Surgical management of uncomplicated peptic ulcers is actually rare, and this is because uncomplicated ulcers actually respond well to medical treatment. When malignancy is confirmed, or complications like, for instance, massive bleeding or gastrointestinal perforation, then surgeries that are specific to these complications must be performed. The indications for surgery include refractory symptoms or recurrence of this peptic ulcer disease, despite appropriate medical treatment, um, a disease that requires continuation of NSAIDs. So remember, I said there are some there are some times you actually need to continue these NSAIDs, and in one of these um, diseases includes uh, ankylosing spondylitis. So you have to continue use of NSAIDs. So for these people, you will immediately recommend that uh, they um, undergo elective surgery. And also, if there's an inability to tolerate medical treatment, you can also indicate elective surgery. Some of these surgical procedures include vagotomy, um, in particular truncal vagotomy, which is a surgical division of the anterior and posterior vagal trunk. Uh, 
Now, both of these trunks are actually located along the lower esophagus, and the innervation through this trunkal vagotomy results in approximately 70% reduction of acid production. However, there are usually complications of this vagotomy, and some of them include delayed gastric emptying and then also um, post vagotomy diarrhea. In order to improve the results of this trunk trunk vagotomy, we usually combine it with some other um, surgical procedures, like for instance pyloroplasty or antrectomy or even subtotal gastrectomy. Another surgical procedure we can do is partial gastrectomy, also known as Bureth, and reconstruction. So for Bureth 1 or partial gastrectomy 1, there is distal gastrectomy with an end-to-end -end or side-to-end gastroduodenostomy. For Bureth 2, there is resection of the distal two-thirds of the stomach with a blind ending duodenal stump and end-to-side gastrojejunostomy. Another surgical procedure is total gastrectomy and reconstruction, also known as Rooks NY. On this slide, we can see Bureth 1 procedure. On this slide, we can see Bureth 2 procedure. And on this slide, we can actually see Rooks NY anastomosis. Some complications of peptic ulcer disease includes bleeding. And this is actually the most common complication. It can be a chronic slow bleed or an overt rapid life-threatening hemorrhage. The causes include posterior duodenal ulcers, which are the most likely to bleed than anterior duodenal ulcers, and then also um, ulcers in the lesser curvature, which may cause bleeding from the left gastric artery. In the case of posterior duodenal ulcers, the um, actual vessel that it mostly bleeds from is from the gastroduodenal artery. Now, the clinical features include um, hematemesis, um, melena, anemia, hematochesia, which is less common and is only seen in massive bleeding, and also orthostatic hypotension. The treatment includes um, nail per hose, meaning not sticking anything through the mouth, volume resuscitation, transfusion, and also endoscopy. Another complication is perforation. Perforation is actually a full thickness injury and uh, loss of bowel wall integrity. And this results in leakage of gastrointestinal contents. It's the second most common complication of peptic ulcer disease. And peptic ulcer disease is actually the most common cause of perforation in the GI tract. The most common etiology include prepyloric gastric ulcers and also duodenal ulcers of the anterior wall. The clinical features include sudden, diffuse abdominal pain and rigidity, fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, and hypotension, pneumoperitoneum, and shoulder pain as a result of irritation of the phrenic nerve because if the contents of the, um, of the gastrointestinal tract are expelled into the peritoneal cavity, there is like pushing of the, of the diaphragm which contains the phrenic nerve, and we know that this will be felt in the shoulders. The treatment for this also includes neoperos, um, volume resuscitation and supportive care. We can do Graham's patch, which is a surgical repair of a small perforated duodenal ulcer using a piece of the omentum to close the perforation. Another complication is penetration and fistula formation. And uh, the clinical features include a change of clinical symptoms that are related to the affected neighboring organs, as if there's a fistula formation with um, the neighboring organ that there's penetration to, then there can be a change of the symptoms. And let's say, for instance, the organ that there is fistula formation with is the colon. So there might be copremesis and also postprandial diarrhea. There's fistula formation with the liver or spleen or even diaphragm. Then there might be visceral abscess that will show symptoms such as fever, abdominal tenderness, and sepsis. 
if there is a fistula with the gastrododenal artery or even the aorta, and these fistulas will result in severe hemorrhage. If there's a fistula formation with the biliary tree, then there might be biliary tract obstruction that will show symptoms such as fever, jaundice, and right upper quadrant pain. If there's a fistula with the pancreas, there will be increased epigastric pain and peritonitis. The treatment of fistulas are made up of conservative management and also surgical resection. Another complication is gastric outlet obstruction, and this is commonly due to a malignancy. Some of the clinical features include postprandial non bilos vomiting. Also, suction splash can be auscultated. Um, there can also be progressive gastric dilation and weight loss. For diagnosing this, what we normally do is we can do imaging, so barium swallow. We can do computer tomography of the abdomen as well. Then the way to confirm this is actually by using um, an endoscope, so esophageal gastroduodenoscopy. Um, if we do laboratory studies, we might actually see hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. Now the treatment can actually be definitive or symptomatic. For symptomatic treatment, of course, we can do nasogastric suction. We can do electrolyte and fluid replacement, and then we can also do parenteral nutrition. For the definitive treatment, we have to do surgery or endoscopic dilation. Another complication is malignant transformation. I remember earlier saying that gastric ulcer have a higher chance for causing cancers, and we should always do biopsy when we've seen endoscopic signs of malignancy. As for duodenal ulcers, they are mostly benign, so routine biopsy is not required. So after treatment, whether surgical or medical or just conservative, we always want to follow up. And indications include gastric ulcer in patients with one or more of the following. If they have refractory symptoms, if they have ulcer of unknown etiology, if they have ulcer that appears malignant on initial esophageal gastroduodenoscopy, even if we did biopsies and then it came out negative. Also in um, patients that no biopsy was taken after initial esophageal gastroduodenoscopy, maybe due to an active bleeding, or ulcer that is diagnosed via radiological imaging. For duodenal ulcers, we recommend endoscopic follow-up if symptoms persist after appropriate course of antisecretory treatment. For bleeding peptic ulcer requiring initial emergency endoscopy, endoscopic control should be done on the following day. If we do endoscopy and we see dysplasia, we have to follow up with more endoscopies after every 6 to 12 months, depending on the degree of dysplasia. If this ulcer is a refractory kind of ulcer, we should consider repeated esophageal gastroduodenoscopy until the ulcer heals or the etiology is identified. Also, if there's any new onset of symptoms after successful helicobacter pylori eradication therapy, then we should also do follow-up. Now, the surveillance method is simply repeating endoscopy and obtaining new biopsies. Another recommended follow-up is helicobacter pylori eradication confirmation. So, this is usually indicated in helicobacter pylori associated ulcers and we have to consider the following. This confirmation must be performed four weeks or more after the helicobacter pylori eradication therapy. Proton pump inhibitors need to be paused at least two weeks before this test. Diagnostic tests include non-invasive and also invasive um, tests for helicobacter pylori. So for non-invasive we have urea breath test also stool antigen assay, then for invasive, endoscopic biopsies with rapid urea testing, and this should only be done if endoscopy is indicated. That's the end of the video. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't.